Hello and welcome. I'm Rick Sears, the Software Development Manager for the Amazon Simple Workflow Service. And I'm happy to share with you today my talk on programming the distribution of work in the cloud using the Amazon Simple Workflow Service and the AWS Flow Programming Framework. So let's go over real quick what we'll cover today. First, I'll introduce a sample distributed application that we'll use as a guide for our discussion. In this sample application, we'll cover core concepts <clears throat> that may be familiar to many of you in, in building your sample, in building your own backend systems. <clears throat> then we'll look at how the sample application could be built and highlight some of the specific challenges we'll need to meet in creating a robust distributed application. Next, we'll look at how the Amazon Simple Workflow Service, or SWF for short, can help us in meeting many of these challenges. Then I'll introduce the AWS Flow Programming Framework and look, look at how we can program our sample application using Flow. And finally, we'll bring it all together and show how our sample application programmed using Flow can run on top of the Amazon Simple Workflow Service to provide the full distributed runtime for our sample application. One quick note, any questions you might have during the talk, please save them for just after the talk where I'll be available down at the front of the stage. And also, the slides for this talk, including the code shown in the slides, will be available after the talk, so no need to write down all the code I'll be showing uh, as it flies by. So let's get started. <clears throat> I'd like to begin with a quick story to set up my sample application. A number of years ago, I made the move from the city where I grew up, Atlanta, to the city where I now call home, Seattle. I worked with a moving company to move my stuff. <clears throat> and lo and behold, when my stuff arrived in Seattle, some of the items just didn't make it. I knew that they'd been packed, so they must have been lost somewhere between Atlanta and Seattle. I called the moving company, explained the best I could the items that didn't make it, and thus began the multi-week ordeal of getting my stuff back. Thinking back recently on this process, I wondered what the moving company's back-end system for searching for missing items might look like. It seemed like in building this type of application, we would encounter a lot of the same challenges that customers I've spoken with have, have uh, found in their own build, building their own back-end systems. And since I'm always excited about talking with customers about how to build their back-end systems using AWS services, I wondered what this back-end system for finding missing stuff might look like built using the Amazon Simple Workflow Service. So let's do this. Let's build this application using the Amazon Simple Workflow Service. So at a high level, what might this process look like? First, my frustrated self would need to enter in all the information about my missing stuff and the shipment it was on into the moving company systems to help them start the search. Second, the moving company, we need to search the warehouse that my stuff was stored in on its way from Atlanta to Seattle. And last, the moving company would either need to ship me the items it found back to Seattle or cut me a check for the items that are truly lost. So I want to focus on the second half of this overall process, the search of the warehouse and the eventual recovery or reimbursement for my missing items. Let's start off by talking in general terms about how we might run the steps in this part of our overall process. We'll focus on just one of the steps, the search of the warehouse for my missing stuff. First, we have some, sort of, some amount of logic associated with searching the warehouse. This logic could include working with the inventory systems of the warehouse to search for records of my missing stuff. It could also involve cutting tickets to the staff in the warehouse to go and actually physically search the warehouse for my missing stuff. We'd want a good bit of this logic to be running in code so we can execute it reliably whenever we need to do a search. To run the code, we need to bring online one or more machines and a cluster of machines to host the system processes running the code. This setup would be true for all of my steps in my sample application. Get the logic into code and run that code on a cluster of machines. So how might the machines running our code be deployed? Let's start off by giving a name to the cluster of machines we just talked about. Since these machines are doing the actual work in our sample application, we'll call them machine workers, or workers for short. When deploying these workers, we need, we need to consider that each of these workers hosting a logically distinct step in my sample application 
might need to run in a different network location than the other steps. For example, the search of the warehouse might need to run at some point on premises in the warehouse. The workers running the item shipping step may be part of a, a part of my application that I've been able to upgrade and run on Amazon EC2 instances <coughs> to run the logic in the cloud. And finally, the workers doing my item, item reimbursement step might need to run in my lockdown corporate network to interface with a restricted access billing system. These requirements to deploy code to distinct systems running in different network locations may seem familiar to many of you since this is common when moving existing applications into the cloud. We need to make sure that we utilize technologies that allow workers to run where they need to run and be combined with other workers to get the whole process done. Since all the workers for our steps in our sample application might be running in different network, network locations, we'll need to use some sort of scheme to coordinate the workers to get the overall process done from start to finish. The way many of you might model this is by using another worker who acts as the coordinator for the inter interactions between our step-specific workers. This worker is a machine or set of machines just like our other step-specific workers. Instead of executing the logic for a single step, this worker would kick off the whole process, keep track of what's going on, <clears throat> and initiate the work for our other workers. One of the key things to understand about this worker that's running the show is why it needs to keep track of progress as part of its job of coordinating our other workers. The record of progress we're talking about here includes the transitions from one step to, an to another in our overall process. For example, it would contain a record of when we started the warehouse search, when the warehouse search finished, and then when we subsequently started the item shipping step. This worker needs to know about the progress to be able to make decisions about what should happen next in the overall process when it receives a notification that a worker has completed its work. This record of progress also allows us to recognize when a step has taken too long, even in the event that that worker is unable to report back progress. And finally, this record should be durable in the event that the workers managing our overall process are enabled or completely down and another worker needs to pick up from where they left off. So this worker needs to use some sort of external storage such as a relational database to make sure that the record of progress is available and up to date in the event of machine failure. So now that you have more of an idea of what our sample application might look like, and also have gotten a small taste of the challenges we need to face, let's dive deeper into some of the other challenges. First, our sample application needs to be able to scale up the workers as the number of searches grows. The sample application also needs to be able to handle failures that occur at any part like the ones we discussed. Our sample application also needs to have its interactions optimized to be as fast as possible in getting work to workers. And finally, operators of our sample application need to be able to look at what is happening or has happened to audit every step in our overall process. These challenges is what Amazon Simple Workflow was built to meet. Our team recognized that the key piece necessary for all com in common to all types of multi-step applications running on machines in different network locations was the handling of coordination actions and the tracking of progress of work spread across these machines. By taking care of the tracking of progress, SWF removes the burden of complexity, managing the durable record for workers that are running the show. SWF also acts as the reliable shepherd of work that needs to be handed out to our workers to get the steps done. So the job of building our sample application becomes simplified by the features offered by SWF. The machine workers only need to focus on the logic for individual steps or the logic of what should happen next instead of all the coordination muck. So let's now look at the specific features of SWF that help us in meeting these challenges. Let's look at our first challenge, scalability. Our sample application needs to be able to add workers to any part of our architecture at any time, quickly and easily, if it becomes a processing bottleneck. Also, our, to be able to, to add these workers quickly and easily, our workers need to be stateless so that they can come online and start working without having to synchronize their internal view of the overall process state. To keep our workers stateless, we need the state 
or record of progress we just talked about to be stored by another system and given to our workers when they need it. So Amazon SWF provides three key features that help us in keeping our process scalable. First, we are the repository of state for the entire distributed application. SWF keeps track of the outstanding work for our individual workers and also the history of what has happened so far in our overall process to provide a view of the application state for both step-specific workers and workers running the whole show. Second, SWF, uh, pollers poll SWF for work, which naturally load balances as workers become available. Polling allows workers to come online and start working without having to uh, bring online resources for receiving requests or punch holes in their firewall to receive work in restricted parts of our network. And last, SWF hands out tasks to workers exactly once. Do we need work to be handed out exactly once because of our purposeful lack of state on our workers to keep them scalable and stateless, which does not allow for workers to, to handle duplicate work that might have already been worked on? So let's look back at our sample application architecture and see what supports for scalability mean for, for this sample application. With the ability to add workers at any place at any time, we're able to add new workers to our warehouse search workers with very little setup. The ability to add on-demand is essential to maintaining a great customer experience as the use of our application grows. Our sample application also efficiently scales because we're focusing workers on only one portion of our overall architecture instead of throwing hardware at all parts, which would be the case if we were running all of our logic in one process. So what about our next challenge, fault tolerance? Applications experience failures for many reasons. There could be dependency failures, such as a database or another service. You could fail using machine resources, such as memory or I.O. There could even be bugs in the handling of certain types of data in our workers. Each of these failures may have a different mitigation or recovery action that needs to be put in place to handle the failure. And also, when failures occur, we need to react as quickly as possible. So we need automated failure handling built into the system we use, including timeouts for workers that are taking too long. SWF provides three key features for fault tolerance. First, because SWF is the repository of state for our entire application, result of failure on one worker doesn't result in a, a loss of overall progress to continue running our process. This resiliency is true for both workers doing specific steps as well as workers managing our overall process. Second, SWF supports timeouts on work being done in our application and also allows us to kick off work over and over again if, we don't, if it doesn't finish successfully. This means if one worker is unable to complete its work for any reason, and we, we can react to this failure as soon as possible based on the timeout set for this work and retry as often as possible. And last, SWF allows us to pass failures explicitly as part of a call from workers to a service API. This allows workers to communicate failures that they handle as part of working with a dependency that may become available for some reason and handle it as needed as part of our overall process logic. So what do these supports for fault tolerance mean for our sample application architecture? If the worker coordinating our overall process dies, we need another worker to take over as quickly as possible. SWF will recognize this failure even if the worker is completely unable to contact the service and redispatch this work to another worker. This happens as quickly as we define based on the timeout settings set on the coordination work. This ability is also true for any other part of our sample application, including each of the other sets of workers. And SWF provides the option of setting separate timeouts on work done in each step. So what about our next challenge, low latency? Our sample application needs to be able to get work to workers as quickly as possible. And this means we need to be able to choose a mechanism to hand out work that is scalable while maintaining low latency. Our sample application also needs to be able to send certain work to specific workers or groups of workers that may have different resources dedicated to doing a certain type of work. SWF provides two key features to help <coughs> keep our, la our latency low. First, we keep a pull request open for machines asking for work until work is available to be handed out to that worker. <coughs> 
This means this type of polling, called long polling, provides low latency without having to ha have the polar poll as frequently as possible for work. Second, we send specific work to specific workers through the use of task lists. A task list allows specific work, is, can be made specific to workers or groups of workers, and using task lists is as easy as configuring it at runtime for a worker to poll on a specific task list. Task lists support all different types of routing of work to workers, such as cache optimized work, where the same worker would work on something over and over again, or even high priority work, which may utilize a dedicated group of workers. So let's look back again at our sample application and find out what low latency supports mean for our architecture. The long poll behavior is built into our use of simple workflow, and therefore, we have low latency distribution of work to our workers. But with the ability to route <clears throat> certain tasks to a group of workers, we could have a cluster that was dedicated to high priority searches. When new work for high priority searches comes in, we need, that work, we need those items to be found as fast as possible, and then, so this work should not be held up by lo other lower priority searches that are using all of our regular search workers. So finally, what about auditing our sample application? Operators of our sample application need to be able to look into what is going on or has gone on in any of our searches to be able to diagnose issues or dig deeply into performance issues. There's also a need to keep the records of our process executions around for a while after they execute to suffice for any auditability requirements we might have in our applications. SWF provides three key features to support auditability in our applications. First, we can keep an index of process executions, which in our case are the, the, <clears throat> the searches for specific missing items, which are used to find individual executions that we can dig into. We can find executions by a number of different criteria, such as tags we might specify when they get kicked off, or even the type of failure encountered when an execution ends. Second, we keep a play-by-play -play history of the workflow execution called the execution history. This history contains what has happened in each transition to each step, and so we can use it to diagnose <clears throat> actions taken in specific steps to find the problems that impact the execution of our process. And last, we retain this, both the execution, index of executions, as well as the execution history after the process finishes. And this allows operators to go back and dig into process executions as the need dictates. So finally, what do these auditability requirements mean for our sample application? The play-by-play -play history can show us when the warehouse search step is taking periodically much longer than normal to execute. The play-by-play -play history shows us when the warehouse search work was picked up, when it was finished by the worker. And therefore, we can find work that has taken too long, and the history shows us which worker would have picked up that work. So we can pinpoint the issue to a specific host and dive deeper on logs on that one machine. So now that you've heard about what SWF has to offer us in running our sample application in a robust and scalable way, how, you might wonder how we actually write the code to build our application to run on top of simple workflow. <clears throat> we'll start out our walkthrough by giving our process a formal name, the missing item recovery process. Let's remind ourselves what the actual steps in our process look like. First, we need to do a potentially time-consuming search of the inventory of the warehouse. For any items found, we need to schedule a shipment of the items back to my address in Seattle. And finally, for any items not found, we need to calculate the value and cut a check. Given these set of steps, let's look at the interfaces for the code that executes each one of these steps. First, we have the warehouse search step component that has the logic for searching the warehouse. This interface defines a method that performs a search, the search inventory for items method. While we won't go into the details of this specific method, let's assume it only contains a logic necessary to direct the local search of the warehouse the implementation would not contain any code to distribute calls to our search inventory for items method over a network, just plain <clears throat> method calls in a single system executable. Next, we have our item shipping step component, which contains the logic for shipping items. Again, the logic in our ship items to customer method defined in this interface would just contain the logic necessary to interact with the local shipment configuration system. <clears throat> 
And finally, we have the item reimbursement step component, which contains the logic for reimbursement of items. As with the other two components, the code that runs in this interface and the method is in this interface, the reimburse items to customer method, would just contain the logic for interacting with the billing system to cut a check. So once we have each step in its own component interface, we want to put all these steps together using logic that defines how these steps interact in our overall process. We'll define this logic in the code you see now, the missing item recovery process implementation class. To start, each step can be executed using local references to an instance of the components we just talked about. We'll define the coordination logic, or how those components should execute one after the other, and then portion of the missing item recovery process implementation class shown here, the search and replace missing items method. The steps in our overall process are defined as method calls to the local references in the implementation class. Making calls to local object references using standard Java syntax results in a clean and understandable version of our sample application logic. The focus of each call is execute just the logic necessary to get the step done. But because each component only contains logic for the individual steps and does not contain logic to distribute the calls over a network, it is not scalable or fault tolerant in the way, our, way we originally envisioned for our sample application. What I'd like to be able to do is take this code, <clears throat> which has a simplicity and clarity of understanding, and distribute it to workers, fault, make it fault tolerant in its processing, scalable to handle lots of work, and auditable in its execution with minimal changes. So you've probably been down this road before. You've built applications that coordinate work over workers time and time again. You know that the code we would have to write for this would not look very close to the code we just saw once we, once we handle all the problems of distributed applications. But this is what, exactly what we want the customers of SWF to be able to do. Take their code and with minimal changes, <coughs> make it distributed to workers in their fleet. This is why we created the AWS Flow programming framework to give customers the ability to take their applications and with minimal work evolve them into robust distributed applications. So what is Flow? Flow is a distributed programming library written in Java. Java is just one of the languages you can use to build applications to run on top of Amazon Simple Workflow, but it's currently the only uh, language supported by the AWS Flow framework. The library uses standard Java language constructs, such as extending classes or annotating classes or methods to work with your code. It also provides simple classes that can be used as part of generated code to integrate with your logic. To be able to plug into the execution stack, Flow uses bytecode ma manipulation to become part of the call stack to provide distributed execution supports. Flow wraps your logic to execute distributed to workers using the Amazon Simple Workflow service. Underneath the covers, Flow is just using standard service API calls. And finally, Flow is open sourced under the Apache 2.0 license and hosted on GitHub and distributed with the AWS SDK. So Flow provides a number of key benefits to you as a distributed application builder. First, your Flow allows you to take your code and make the critical pieces of it distributed workers with minimal changes. We'll see examples of these minimal changes in just a little bit. Second, Flow builds in distributed failure handling into its programming model. This includes support for common mitigations like retry with exponential backoff. And finally, Flow's constructs scale with the complexity of your logic. For example, parallel work can add significant amount of complex code especially when you need to wait on the results of the parallel branches before continuing forward. With Flow, parallel work becomes back-to-back -back calls to methods of components that you want to execute at the same time with simple semantics to wait before moving forward. So let's take a look at how we can evolve our original code to, to execute using Flow. We'll start first by augmenting the first step in our application, the search of the warehouse to run using Flow. Shown here is the original interface of the warehouse search step component. The entry point method of this component is the search inventory for items method. To be able to execute this method on worker machines instead of only on a single host, we need this method to execute disconnected from the Java call stack of the host running the rest of our application. 
We want Flow to provide supports for executing the search inventory for items method distributed across worker instances. So to do this, we need to mark the interface with a Flow provided annotation, the at activities annotation. Flow and SWF call pieces of logic that execute on worker machines activities. The at activities annotation is applied at the interface level and exposes all methods as handled by Flow. Since we only have one method in our interface, this becomes a single activity Flow will distribute to our workers. So how does Flow take part in executing our logic? First, the Flow libraries are used to process our Flow-specific annotations, like the activities annotation we just saw, to allow your code to be instrumented with Flow supports. The annotation processing libraries are first used at compile time to produce a version of your code that exposes Flow-specific constructs that are necessary to interact with activity methods without blocking. We'll get into why we want to execute without blocking in just a little bit. The code for Flow that Flow produces is a wrapper around your code, so the semantics of your code are preserved in these wrapping classes. And finally, the libraries are also used at runtime to actually plug into the call stack of the, in the Java process that's executing our code. Let's take a look at the output of our annotation processing library for the warehouse search step component we annotated as an activity. The code displayed is the first few lines of the interface produced. The first thing you'll notice is the use of the term client, which is tacked on to the name of this generated class, the warehouse search step client. Flow uses the suffix client for any code that wraps your code to provide non-blocking supports. Next, we have the first variation of the search inventory for items method exposed in this generated code. Each variation of our activity method provides a different means to integrate that method into flow-managed overall process logic. The main difference between this variation and the one we wrote originally is the use of the promise class, which wraps the collection of item objects we're returning from this method. So what is a promise? A promise is a, is a class provided by Flow that wraps the information that goes into or out of a method managed by Flow. Promises act as a placeholder for the actual information that will be provided to our code at some point in the future. A promise becomes ready, or what we call fulfilled, when the activity that returns a promise finishes its execution. Having a handle to the result of a method managed by Flow allows us to interact with these methods in our overall process logic without blocking. We want to be able to execute logic without blocking because some logic may take a fair bit of time to execute, and tying up the worker running our overall process to wait on the result is not an option if we want to scale efficiently. This may sound similar to the future concept exposed in the Java concurrency libraries. The big difference here is the future interface is <clears throat> constructed with exceptions and behaviors that force a blocking semantic on interactions with the methods of the future interface. We took a different approach with Flow. The methods of the promise class are not used to explicitly block forward execution of threads. Instead, it is the passing of a promise from one area code to another that is used to signify that that code replies upon the results of the previous code and should wait until the method that returned the promise is done executing. We'll get into the details of how we allow for blocking in just a second. Another really interesting support that the non-blocking handles provide us is the ease at which we can run steps in parallel. Running steps in parallel is as simple as calling flow-managed activity methods that return promises back to back and putting them into a collection of promises. We use the collection of promises with simple logic that defines whether or not we want to wait on all or any of the promises to finish before we continue forward with our overall process logic. So how do we use promises in our coordination logic? First, we need to replace the reference we had to the warehouse search step component with the flow generated client you see now, the warehouse search step client. I use this reference to make the same call to the search inventory for items method as before, but now handle the return as a promise instead of a simple collection of item objects. This is where the execution of our code actually begins. But our applica overall application logic is not blocked on this execution completing. So even if it takes days or weeks to search the warehouse, we don't consume resources on the workers running our code while it executes. In the next step, I make a call to an internal method, the ship or reimburse missing items method, that uses the found items to ship the items back to our customers or cut a check for the items truly lost. 
This method is where I actually need the results of the warehouse, the items found in the warehouse. So this method is what I want to make as a barrier to execution of our overall process logic until the execution of the warehouse search is done and the promise is fulfilled. So how do, tell, how do I tell Flow that I want the ship or reimburse missing items method to execute only once the promise is fulfilled? Shown is the ship or reimburse missing items method. You'll notice that I've added an annotation to this method, the at asynchronous annotation. Adding the at asynchronous annotation tells Flow that this, to treat this method as a barrier to promises being passed into the method. The promise to the collection of items being passed into this method must be fulfilled for it to proceed. So Flow will ensure that the search inventory for items activity method is done executing before executing our ship or reimburse missing items method. This gives me the barrier I need to perform logic on the results of the warehouse search. To actually use the value returned in the activity method, I make a call to the get method of the promise interface, which returns the, collection of wrap, uh, the wrapped collection of item objects found in the warehouse. As I mentioned before, the call to the get has no need to block because I'm guaranteed by flow that the asynchronous execution of the search logic is done at this point. The rest of our method is still standard calls to our components executing the last two steps. To get the same supports for all of our steps <clears throat> to be able to execute using flow, we would need to make the same changes we made to the warehouse search logic, but let's focus on finishing out our current changes to get the current code executing using flow. So as a final step, let's see how we can use flow to become part of our overall process logic in the missing item recovery process implementation class we just looked at. To indicate to flow that it needs to participate in the overall process logic, we, use, we place a flow specific annotation, the at workflow annotation, on the interface of our component class. Flow and SWF call logic that calls, makes, uh, calls to activities a workflow. The at workflow annotation tells flow that it contains methods that need to be managed by flow, such as the at asynchronous method we just looked at, and one method that will be annotated as the entry point into our overall process. There's a bit more to getting the execution kicked off, but I'll have to save that for you to explore outside this talk. So what we've just seen is the main bulk of code changes necessary to make our sample application have work distributed to workers. Now you may ask yourself, how does Flow actually run this sample application using SWF? Let's take a quick look at our original architecture to explore how Flow maps your logic on interactions with SWF. Our workers were set up to handle different steps in our application logic, allowing pieces to be distributed in their own unique manner. The, worker, we had, the workers were coordinated by another worker, which controlled the interactions between steps. When we went through the flow code, we talked about how flow and SWF called dis the distributed execution, execution of our step logic activities. So when we talk about the machine workers that are executing each step, we use the term activity workers to refer to these step-specific worker fleets. Let's dive deeper into the activity workers by looking at the construction of our warehouse search activity worker. We'll start with the general structure of a worker process. Each flow-based worker process has some set of our logic, such as the logic for searching the warehouse inventory and an instantiation of the AWS SDK to communicate with the SWF service. Flow libraries wrap your logic as part of a system process running in a JVM and kick off in any place you choose, Amazon EC2, your company network, really anywhere that can make an outbound network call. You write your code, as we saw earlier, by segmenting your logic into activities and coordination logic that are deployed independently. Flow handles all the underlying supports to get work to workers when necessary. So how is our activity worker constructed? The activity worker process containing our warehouse search activity logic will be packaged with just the code necessary to do this one part of our process. We'll first include the warehouse search step interface we annotated with the at activities annotation. We'll also include the warehouse search step implementation class into this package code. Finally, there's configuration code that we use to set up the worker. We won't go over the specifics of the setup code, but the parameters are straightforward to configure and it's easy to write. So with all of this code packaged together, we have an activity worker that's ready to run. So how does Flow know when to execute the logic contained in our activity worker? The SWF client is the conduit by which the warehouse search step logic is, gets executed. 
Our flow code uses the SWF client to periodically ask the SWF service if the warehouse search step logic should execute. If there's a record that this logic should execute, flow will, the client will receive a task assigned to the worker as a response to the request for work. This task represents the desire to make a single execution of our logic in the activity. The flow framework code is plugged into this, this SWF client and understands the needs to execute the search inventory for items method using the information in the task. In our, it's our specific logic executing at this point, based on what we wrote in the implementation class and using the data attached to the task that was returned from the service. When the activity method is done executing, flow takes back control, packages up the results of that activity execution, and calls a response API with a record of the task completing. The record of task completion becomes part of the record of progress or application state, which is stored by SWF. So now that we've seen how to create activity workers, let's take a look at the logic that runs the whole show. One important idea at the core of flow-based applications is that our overall process logic is also handled by a flow-based worker, just like our activity workers. Instead of handling single invocations, this worker handles changes in our application state. When we talked about the code that manages our overall process, we used the term workflow to mark the coordination logic running the show. So when we talk about machine workers handling the transitions in our overall process, we'll use the term workflow workers. Let's now dig into the workflow workers construction to run our missing item recovery process. So how are our workflow workers created? The workflow worker is packaged with just the code necessary to run the logic to call activities, one after the other. We do not include the implementation of activities, just the flow-generated wrapper classes, such as the warehouse search step client, to integrate the activities into our overall process. In addition, we package the flow, with the flow-generated classes, we include the missing item recovery process implementation class we annotated with the at workflow annotation. We also include the missing item recovery process implementation class which is the heart of our coordination logic into this package code. Finally, there's configuration code, just like the activity workers, to set up these workers. Once this is packaged all together, our workflow worker is ready to be deployed. So how does our overall process logic get evaluated on the workflow worker? To start, as with the activity worker, the SWF client is the conduit by which this worker is initiated. <clears throat> the flow code uses the SWF client to periodically ask the service if any ongoing execution of the missing item recovery process logic has changed state. As we talked about earlier, a change in state is it represents a progression in a workflow, like a new workflow being kicked off, or an activity finishing its execution, like we talked about with the activity worker. If there's an ex execution that has changed state, the worker receives a task as a response to the request for changed executions. This task contains the history for one of our uh, changed executions. The flow framework understands how to use this history, along with the logic defined in our class marked with the at workflow annotation to determine what should happen next. Even though we didn't go into the details of the information contained in the history, the idea is simple. The history contains a record of activity execution that we use to replay the logic in our workflow class to the point where the logic last left off. We collect what activities in that code should be done next and turn those into commands to execute new activities. The worker packages up these new activities at commands into a response object that is sent back through a response API to the service. So now SWF has a record of our new activities to execute, which goes to our activity worker and gets executed as we described earlier. So Flow is actually acting as the execution handler for both our activity workers running our activity logic and our overall process logic running in our workflow workers. While we didn't get to go over covering the other, turning the other steps into activities, the same changes can apply. And with these other two steps running in workers, we now have an architecture that is distributed and scalable in multiple distinct dimensions, from our individual activity logic to our overall process logic. Hopefully you see now how minimal the changes and how straightforward the deployment of our sample application can be when running using SWF and Flow. Our customers see enormous value in using Flow to evolve their applications. <clears throat> you may have read about NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory's use of AWS services, including Amazon Simple Workflow, as part of their mission support systems 
for the Mars Science Laboratory, better known as the Curiosity Mars rover. NASA JPL used Flow to create data processing pipelines for tactical operations and scientific analysis that are critical to this mission's success. They describe creating complex image processing workflows, including parallel executions with dependent steps to execute after those are done with only a few simple lines of Java code using Flow. Using Flow and SWF allows NASA JPL to focus on the true nature of their work, science and exploration, instead of building and managing infrastructure to orchestrate their components. If you attended our earlier talk, you heard about Fluid's use of Flow and SWF for their customer branding processing pipelines. Fluid ramped up quickly on Flow and uh, on SWF by evolving their existing image processing pipeline to run on SWF in no small part to their use of Flow to build their application. Like NASA JPL, Flow was able to create massive parallel processes with small, small amount of code primarily directed at the core business needs, speeding up the time to delivery of their application, enhancing, and enhancing their developer productivity. Fluid also saw value in using Flow and SWF in other parts of their business beyond image processing to coordinate work for processes gathering and disseminating information through social media. And finally, another customer that use, has used Flow and SWF to great success is New Concepts Development. They use Flow and SWF in one of their key pro businesses that processes public information gathered from a variety of distinct sources, both free and paid for use, to assist in the recovery of funds owed to their customers. Their data collection use case where activities are running custom actions to grab a variety of data from a variety of sources and integrating this in a co common processing pipeline is a great example of using the core coordination features of SWF with the ease of writing custom logic using standard Java code in Flow. So now that you've seen how Flow and SWF operate in action, I want to call you to action to look at how you are building your processes to see how much Flow and SWF can help make them easier to program and easier to operate. Hopefully you can see how <clears throat> simple, the simple sample application is only the beginning. Even though Flow can be used for the simplest of applications, Flow shines even more when the complexity of our application increases. This complexity can come from the many failure scenarios we talked about earlier. While we didn't get to discuss failure handling in Flow, I encourage you to look into this particular area, especially built-in supports for exponential retries and how we model failures using try-catch-finally constructs to see what we have to offer. Another complex problem you may have run into is the need to react to external information that comes in during the normal processing of the steps in your application. And I encourage you to look into how Flow and SWF can help here as well. And finally, even if your application is not written entirely in Java, you can still plug in other languages, written, writing, writing your activities into SWF and orchestrate them all using Flow. So there's a number of ways to learn more about Flow and SWF. First, we'll continue to provide more and more detailed information on the AWS website. From the AWS website, you can explore full-fledged examples, such as a cron example showing how to use a workflow as a cron to execute other workflows, and show, and as well as many other different types of applications. We've also recently released 17 code recipes that can give you a quick leg up in applying flow in many common coding situations. We've also hosted two webinars and I encourage you to take a look at those to find out more informa information on SWF and flow. And as I mentioned before, flow is open sourced, so I encourage you to look under the covers to see how flow offers the supports it does to our distributed applications. There's also additional opportunities here at reInvent to learn more. A really, there's a really exciting talk coming up by NASA JPL about their use of AWS, and you can also hear more about their use of SWF later today. You can also come by the AWS Application Services booth and ask additional questions about Flow and SWF, or see me write more code about scenarios supported by Flow and SWF as you feel. Thanks for your time today. And we look forward to your feedback, either through an evaluation form or through comments on Twitter. And feel free to meet me at the front of the stage to ask questions or get in touch through the AWS forums. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the conference.